Okay. Uh, okay, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, it's, I'm very happy to be back to Paris uh, and especially to this room. Maybe last time I gave a seminar here was my PhD defense, I'm not sure. So it's nice to be back. Um, all right, so uh, topic of today is to try to um, uh, get the accelerated expansion of our universe from string theory and more generally trying to characterize what, what type of scalar potentials you can get from string theory. Uh, it's based on this work and, and on many others by the community. Okay, so let's get started. Um, okay, so as I said, the, the motivation is dark energy. Uh, as you probably know, dark energy is the energy responsible for uh, the accelerated expansion that we observe today in our universe. And we also think this has already happened in the early universe uh, during the inflation phase. So um, dark energy today is well described by a cosmological constant, uh, lambda, which is positive. Um, and in the early universe, we rather tend to describe it with a scalar potential V, which is also positive. Uh, it's very flat. Um, maybe I can take this. Um, so it's very flat. So it means the first derivative uh, V prime uh, compared to V is, is much smaller than one. And uh, it's uh, the observations by Planck uh, validates uh, having a model of just a single scalar field, which is slowly rolling down the flat potential. This is in very good agreement then with observations. Um, okay, so this is dark energy for us. And so we're, we're gonna consider uh, a four dimensional theory uh, of scalar fields coupled to gravity of this form. Um, so, uh, so just scalar fields and the scalar potential, this is uh, minimally coupled scalar fields. Um, and in most of the talk, I'm gonna consider actually only one scalar field, but many things generalize to uh, multi-fields. And as, as, we, as you probably know, from such a theory, we can reproduce dark energy as solutions to this theory. Um, so as, as I just said before, uh, simply having a very flat uh, potential with a single field, slowly rolling, this gives us inflation. Uh, and for the cosmological constant, it's rather getting a critical point of a potential, so a, a minimum or a maximum, um, so some extremum of a potential, and then your field is stuck there, doesn't move, and the potential is then a constant, and the constant is given by the cosmological constant, it's also related to the four-dimensional uh, curvature. So because of this, this is a Dositta space-time. So we also call this a Dositta solution. Yeah, so, so this is dark energy for us. And so now the question is, can we get this from string theory? Um, so this means, can we get such a theory from string theory? Uh, but it, all, it not only means this, it also means, can we get this theory, but also with a positive potential and with the right shape for the potential. Um, so, of course, uh, uh, the motivation behind this is to sort of provide a, some, some origin or some nature for dark energy. Um, and also it would allow to distinguish among the various potentials that you may imagine, because for now the observations uh, are still okay with many different potentials. It would be nice to, to distinguish among them if we had one from string theory and some which cannot be obtained from string theory, for instance. Okay, so can we get this? Um, so the first thing is uh, this we can get very easily. Uh, it's very natural for us to get from a string compactification uh, a theory like this with uh, a scalar potential. And the scalar potential is just due to the extra dimensions. Its shape is fixed by uh, the physical content you have in the extra dimensions. Uh, so I think this is something to put forward. This is uh, very natural for us to get this. Uh, However, uh, the two other things are much more difficult. So getting a positive potential and in addition with the right shape, right shape being, as we've seen, very flat basically, uh, is a very challenging point, um, especially if, well, if we want to do this in, in a well-motivated, in a well-controlled way. Um, so this is the, the topic of the talk, basically. We'll see 
what's the situation on this? And why is it difficult? So um, to do this, uh, I will first talk of, uh, well, if we can get the city solutions, especially classical ones, and then we will leave this point and study rather the question of uh, uh, what's the slope of the scalar potential. And, and if you have a field rolling there, is this also good or not? And what we can get there. Um, since the topic is uh, scalar potentials, um, as you know, uh, the second derivative of the scalar potential typically uh, describes the stability of, of your solution. Uh, it's also uh, related to uh, the mass spectrum that you can obtain. And so there will be a few side results uh, related to this question. Um, the first side result is uh, what is called the massless Minkowski conjecture. It's the observation or, of a claim that uh, we very often uh, get a, a massless scalar mode uh, in a Minkowski background. Actually, I don't know of a single counter example of a Minkowski solution in supergravity where you don't get a massless scalar. So the, the conjecture is that it's always the case. Uh, and the second side result is uh, a mass bound that we seem to obtain uh, in supersymmetric ADS solutions. <clears throat> and there the claim is that there would always be a scalar with mass m square uh, smaller than minus two in, in units of the ADS radius. And this is, this is meant to be true in any dimension uh, higher than four, uh, four or higher. Um, as it compared to the right and order, the yes, good. Um, we'll see that in the very last slide, but uh, the BF bound is, is, is lower than this. Uh, so it's minus 2.25 uh, in 40, and it gets more and more negative. So, uh, yeah, so it's fine with this. Yeah, so these are two side results re related to uh, scalar potentials and, and uh, spectra. Okay, uh, let's then get started. Um, <clears throat> okay. And we start with these the city solutions and classical the city solutions. Okay. <clears throat> so we're interested in getting the city solutions, the city string backgrounds, and uh, classical ones. So why classical? Um, well, the main motivation is that it's easier to control. So classical means uh, tree-level, uh, low-energy approximation. So it means that your uh, your solution is such that the string coupling is very small. Your typical length are higher than the string length. Uh, and so in this situation, it's, it's easier to control the corrections. Um, there are certainly many other approaches in the literature, uh, most famous being uh, KKLT, or the large volume scenario. And those typically include various uh, corrections, perturbative corrections or non-perturbative contributions. And this leads to, um, well, as, as you may have heard, a lot of discussions on whether what people are doing is okay or not, whether the approximations are valid, whether we trust the regimes we're in, uh, whether we have a good control on these corrections, et cetera. So um, here the argument is really uh, simplicity and we'll, we'll only focus on. Uh, this type of situation. Yes. When you say solution, you always mean a solution of a poor D effective theory, or could it be more general? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, no, so for me, it will be uh, 10D solutions. Uh, and uh, whether it's also a solution of a 4D effective theory is a, is a subtle question, but in my case, it will also be the case. Yes. Another question. When you say solution, you mean really a solution? Or it could be a background which doesn't necessarily so some. So you see that where you can leave on, but it doesn't necessarily solve Einstein equation. No, for me, it's a solution to, uh, as you will see, solutions to uh, tendy supergravity okay. equations of motion. So uh, okay. then there might there are cert certainly hopefully small corrections to this, uh, but at tree level, it's a solution. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so then back to classical. So uh, yeah, as I just said a second ago, uh, to find classical solutions, what you do is you first work with 10D supergravity, 
you find a solution there to the equations of motion and Bianchi identities and so on. Uh, let's call this a candidate solution. And in the second step, you should verify whether your solution is indeed a classical string background and therefore whether it verifies uh, these kind of conditions. Um, we'll come back to the distinction between these two things. Okay, so what's the status on this? Um, so I'd like to emphasize a little of the dates here. Um, so before 2020, so to say things have been done recently, but before this, there were only one type of the CITA solutions of this kind, which were known. Uh, this, this is, the CITA solutions were found by these people in, in several papers. Um, so yeah, so the solutions are always of this form. It's uh, the CITA four in four dimensions. And then there are six extra dimensions, which form a group manifold. Um, and these solutions were always obtained in, in type 2a supergravity with the Romans mask yeah. and with uh, four sets of intersecting uh, orientifolds and D-brains, O6, D6. So by set time in um, uh, directions which are wrapped. So there are four sets of directions which are wrapped. Um, and so because they're intersecting, then they break supersymmetry to n equal one in four dimensions. Um, so, so that, that's what was known before. Uh, maybe here you may wonder why, why are we using group manifolds? Uh, well, they're very easy to use, but in addition, it's quite easy to show in, on general grounds that the sitter typically requires a negative uh, internal curvature. So for this reason, we don't use scalar BR because uh, yeah, we want really strictly negative. Okay. So these are non-compact. No, these are compact. compact. Well, um, you want compact. There are also non-compact examples, but you, some of them are so compact, we and we want compact. compact. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, but no, uh, I see what you're referring to. Um, no, you can have compact group manifolds with negative curvature. Maybe uh, the confusion is because it's it's then not only the group, but you also divide by a discrete lattice, which makes it a compact space. Um, so, so this is also implicit here, that there's a lattice, yeah. So they are not simple groups to answer. They're not always simple Lie groups, yeah, yeah. Sometimes there's an extra, yeah, that's true. There's an, it's a quotient by a discrete subgroup, which makes it compact. Yeah. No, they're not singular. Uh, they're not really similar. Are they really compact when you have cups? I mean, I'm, I guess I'm thinking about the SL2 to the main. Um, no, I think I think they're fine. It, it's like they're, they're really like tori, basically. They're just realization of the fibration of tori, essentially, okay. twisted tori, kind of. So, uh, yeah. Like, yeah. So torus is flat, obviously, but but so so torus can be viewed as 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 a non-compact thing divided by a discrete lattice, with discrete identifications, and it's the same type of thing which happens for the others. Uh, so most of them are are solved manifolds, uh, but some of them are also semi-simple. But most of them are not semi-simple actually. Yeah. They're on the other parts, solved groups. And, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so um, as so you can verify like one and two or just one. Sorry, verify like one and two or just one. Uh, here, no. Most of the talk we're going to be in one only. Uh, yeah, I, I'm. I'm going to come back to two. Um, yeah, but most of the talk is about ten super gravity, so we've just been done. Yeah. But, but, but these solutions are not to the first equation. Do these solutions are these solutions perturbative? Mm -hmm. So so these are when I say solution, this is again solutions to tend to supergravity equations of motion. Right. So, so they, it's so it's one not necessarily satisfy two. They don't they, 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 they most of the time they don't satisfy two, actually, but a priori you don't know, uh, of course. What do you mean you don't? I mean, if you have a solution, you can check, right? Well, you can check yes and no because uh, this is tricky. You need to understand really well what's what's the sixty geometry, and you need to understand what what's the length you need to compare, and so on. So, um, yeah, 
it, it can be a little more difficult than it looks like. But uh, in principle, I agree. In principle, you have a solution, you could do it. But, well, actually, I, I'm, yeah, I don't need to hide anything. So uh, the, the situation is that we know no solution which verifies to actually up to date. Um, that's, that's the situation we're facing now, yeah. Uh, but um, part of it is due to the actual difficulty of verifying these conditions and, and not, yeah, so, yeah, because again, you need to understand exactly uh, the group and the lattice and uh, which volume you need to compare to what and so on. And this is a bit tricky sometimes. Which condition is the most difficult for you? Um, so, so actually, there are dots. So actually, there are five conditions in total. I'll, I'll list them later. Uh, the difficulty is to to meet all of them together. We can meet four out of five, for instance, uh, but not the five together. Yeah. But uh, typically, it's this one, which is most problematic, though. Uh, if, if you need, if you put a, a bit of the arc in the condition, it's it's this one which is most problematic. So so we're close to string length or, or below string length. It, it becomes a bit of a numerical problem or computational problem. Uh, yes, um, or string theory is telling us something that it never exists, or we can find the good solutions. Uh, and in that case, it's it's indeed a numerical problem. Actually, yes, yeah. So, so, so there are ANT faults. Uh, they're put in from the start, and the projection is then verified by the solution and by the setting. So, what what needs to be projected out is already projected out, and uh, yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, so I think with this example, uh, you see already that uh, uh, there's a first difficulty, which is to uh, find such solutions in supergravity, uh, because these solutions require tons of stuff. They require six D curvature, they require fluxes, they require some sources. Uh, so it's a lot of ingredients. And so it's not the first solutions you encounter when you try to solve the equations. You need to put in a lot of things. Uh, so that's the first difficulty. Um, because of this, there's been many no-go theorems developed, which simply say, well, if you don't have this ingredient or that ingredient, then you don't get the sitter. So for instance, if you have positive or zero curvature, or if you don't have this or that flux, then you don't get the sitter. Uh, so this we worked a lot on, on the recent years, and we made progress on this because it helped us identifying what you need actually and where to look if you want to find the city solutions. And I think now we know uh, pretty well. Um, well, first we got new solutions and we know pretty well what is expected, uh, what, what we need for solutions. Um, so this knowledge uh, has been gathered in, in, a, in a sort of classification that we made of the possible solutions. So we made a, a classifications of uh, all solutions you can get in 10D supergravity uh, with um, uh, the sitter Minkowski or anti the sitter, so a maximally symmetric space times. Uh, given a certain ansatz I will specify, but um, and we we developed some codes to to find such solutions, and also we we started a bit of a database of such solutions. So. Uh, well, the ansatz is, is the one I need for the sitter. Uh, so it's this group manifolds, uh, smeared or anti -folds. Um, But I think the classification still goes a bit beyond this ansatz. I think it still shows some structure, as we will see. So the key point in the classification is that we always include the anti -folds, uh, And that, so, so the classification is done according to the anti -folds because of you project out things and so on. So uh, typically, so, so it looks like this. That's a table from the paper. Uh, these are the uh, solution classes. Uh, and the numbers which appear here correspond to which type of orientifold you put, essentially. So according to which orientifold you put, you, you can only have certain d brains and certain orientifolds which are compatible with this. 
and you can only have certain fluxes, certain uh, geometry, etc. So there's a certain field content. Uh, and then we started to look whether there were the Sitter solutions, Minkowski solutions, or anti the Sitter solutions uh, known for all these classes. Um, so when there were known solutions, we put a, a reference and we also looked for new solutions. Uh, we found some with ticks. So I'm very confused. The two water columns preserve supersymmetry. The first one doesn't. Is there, what's the common thing? What's the... Yeah, so we don't care about supersymmetry here. It can preserve or cannot preserve. This is, we're beyond this. Uh, the common thing is you're on a group manifold and you have all antifolds. That, that's the only common thing. Yeah. They're not fully localized solutions? No, they're not localized, sure. No, they're not. Yeah. Yeah. Find solutions well, no, but uh, yeah, that's a well known problem. Um, I mean, there's been recent uh, progress on, on, on this in some, some uh, inside the city solutions where they started to compute the back reaction in some expansion. Uh, but uh, yeah. No, but... So, what's the framework of this analysis? Um, well, we found a way to, um, so, so a framework is, is you, so you have this compactification ansatz, you put an orienti fold in along direction one, direction two, et cetera. And then it tells you which fluxes you can have, some are projected out, some are not. And then you check the Bianchi identities and you see, uh, I can have, an orientifold along that direction, a deep brain along that direction, and things like this. So, so you that's the analysis. Uh, it turns out it becomes very quickly very constraining. And so this is the only list of possibilities. It's not an infinite, it's just a finite list of possibilities that you can get. And, and many solutions in the literature actually fall in one of the boxes there. Basically. And say for supersymmetric cases, does it make contact with things like pure spinners? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so your papers on pure spinners are somewhere here. Uh, yeah. You, you find, we find Minkowski solutions, which were supersymmetric with a 205, uh, you fall here. But it, I don't care about supersymmetry. I'm just looking at equations of motion. So, Never. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm not using this, so I'm beyond this. I'm just looking at what's projected out and what's not, and that's it. Yeah. So, so supersymmetry is a particular case for me. I, I don't care actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, to give you an example, maybe uh, this class here, S six 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 six. So, uh, it's the class I just mentioned before with the the city solution. So you have four intersecting sets of orientables which are placed along certain space dimensions like this. And they're, they're not the same, so uh, uh, they intersect, basically. Uh, and there are famous solutions in this class. So, um, but the Sitter solutions I just mentioned before, uh, some Minkowski solutions were, were found with this type of thing. It's the same thing as intersecting brains on tori, this type of model. It's the same type of configuration, yeah. And the DGKT type of ADS solution also fall in this class. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, but, so there are many other examples. But, yeah. When the box is empty, means there are no solutions. Yeah, good. Uh, when the box is empty, is, I, I don't know, I haven't looked. <laughs> so please take our code and make it run and look. <laughs> uh, but we didn't look. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so the cross is a no-go. There are some boxes where we haven't found solutions. We suspect a no-go, but we cannot prove it either. Those are some of the Decita cases where we suspect a no-go theorem. But for Minkowski and ADS, I, I just don't know. <laughs> we just have to look. <laughs> yeah. What does N mean in the first column? Good, yeah. Uh, so um, S, well, yeah, S is for single uh, type of dimensionality, so you just have six, basically. M is multiple, so it can be uh, uh, four and six, five and seven, uh, and, yeah, things like this. And, uh, David, if instead of a group manifold, you took, say, three Riemann surfaces. Good, yeah, yeah. Can you do this? Um, well, so, um, yeah, so... 
the good thing about the group manifold and the ansatz is that um, uh, all components are constant. Uh, flux components are constant. The source contribution is constant because it's smeared. And because it's a group manifold, the spin connection is constant. And because it's constant with the orientiful projection, it's very simple, either it's zero or either it's not zero. So that's what makes uh, the list finite, I think, and simple. In principle, you can run the same analysis on, on different manifolds, but then the analysis is more complicated, whether you get odd functions or even functions with respect to the orientifolds and things like this. And so, yeah. But in principle, you can run the same method. Uh, interestingly, we still have quite a lot of physics there. So there are supersymmetric solutions, there are non-supersymmetric solutions, there are stable, unstable, scale separated, not scale separated. There's quite a lot of physics already in this sample. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is maybe useful in general. Uh, let me come back to the sitter. Uh, so I think there are four main players here. It's these four classes. Uh, they have some T-duality relations also, some of them. Um, so, um, and, okay, so the point is that the old solutions I mentioned prior to 2020 were found in there. And so more recently, in the last two, three years, we found new the city solutions in these other classes. So with different orientifold and D-brain uh, configurations, as you can see. So do S and M stand for? Yeah, sorry again. So uh, S means single uh, dimensionality. So P equals five, P equals six sources. M is multiple. So four and six, O oh, five, O oh, seven. Yeah, uh, we had to find a name. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, sorry. So M6 means you have an O6, but you can have D4 or D8. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't want to enter the details here. But, uh, just. The intersecting object is zero is for dimension four. Ah, uh, good question. Uh, so um, not necessarily. So here we just took everybody. Uh, but of course you can you can uh, also uh, well you can also check this uh, and, and of course well there are then less less uh, classes if you do this um, I'll I'll say a word on this about the Decito solutions yeah whether they are well so your question is whether it preserves supersymmetry or not and yeah, uh, yeah I'll, I'll say a word on this yes so the difference between say a single O four and O six is but it projects out and, uh, because in terms of stability, it's so good. Um, it's so difficult to separate them. No, no. So uh, the difference is, um, yeah, okay, it's related to a projection. So the difference is uh, along which direction is it wrapped? Mm -hmm. And the O4 is as three legs in, in the 4D space and, and one leg along the internal manifold. So it, it just wraps one internal manifold, the O4. The O6 wraps three internal uh, directions. No, no, I just smear along the directions wrapped. So, no, sorry, I just smear in the transverse. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's where the word smearing is, is actually a bad word. We're not exactly putting it everywhere. We're actually integrating over the uh, transverse dimension. So we're taking a sort of average along the transverse dimensions. But for instance... The source equation, you just don't have the coordinate dependence. Exactly, exactly. So yes. It does not depend on all transverse coordinates, it depends on... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for instance, in the, in the... It's clearly... Well, I don't know. In the Einstein equation, for instance, you have a, a momentum, uh, energy momentum tensor, which gets contributions from deep brains and orientifolds. And there are directions where you get nothing, and there are directions where you get something. So it's really along some directions and not along others. Yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, all this to say that um, I think the first difficulty is overcome. We know where to find the city solutions. We now find many, actually, with different orientifolds, different fluxes, different geometries. We now have quite a diversity of supergravity the city solutions. Um, and the, the good thing about it is that um, 
given we have a certain diversity, we, we now start noticing general features of the solutions. Uh, and the first feature has to do with supersymmetry, actually. So uh, we did run the code on all these classes. And the point is, we only found solutions, the Cita solutions, where there were at least three intersecting sets of orientifolds of D-brain. So, so it means, for instance, the orientifold grabs internal directions, one, two, three, one, four, five, et cetera. So it's along three or four different uh, sets. Same here. Um, so, so what does it mean? Uh, it means you need, yeah, intersecting set, and it, this means you do break some supersymmetry. Uh, so this is not completely surprising. There were a few conjectures already. There was one conjecture thinking that if you only have parallel sources only wrapping one set of directions, then you cannot get the Sita solution. This was thought already. And here, what we're now saying is that it's the same with only two. We're saying you need at least three intersecting sets. Uh, and um, there's some, also some argument with T-duality. We, we notice that when you have only two sets, you can do T-dualities on those, and you reach a solution class where we know there's a no-go theorem. Ideally, we would like to prove a no-go theorem for this. We don't manage, but we have some T-duality argument to go to a class where you get, have a no-go theorem. So, uh, Long story short, we think you need at least three intersecting sets of orientifolds to get the sitter, uh, orientifolds or D-brains. And so this has a, an important consequence, uh, which is that the Foley theory from such a compactification, which get a sitter solution, is at most n equal one supersymmetric. Because if you have three of them, you, you, you break it three times. And so you get to n equal one or, or n equal zero. Uh, well, that's a bit too quick, right? I mean, you have three projectors. In principle, you can. Yeah, good, you good. Break more or less. Um, well, the thing we're considering are always orthogonal. So, uh, I mean, uh, in that case, yeah, yeah. Maybe I should specify whether they're orthogonal or not. Yeah, but um, yeah. Okay. And such a claim is actually in agreement with um, the literature of gauge supergravities and, and also with some Swampton papers. Um, let me just say a word on the gauge supergravities. So, so people doing gauge supergravities have, have, you know, they take some gauge supergravity in 4D with a certain number of supersymmetries and they look for the Sitter solutions and they find some. But when you look, so they find some in the theory with n equal eight or n equal two or various numbers of supersymmetries. But when you look at these examples, it turns out that the gaugings they have um, tell you that they cannot come from a compactification. For instance, non-geometric fluxes or non-compact gauging, which may signal a non-compact uh, manifolds or things like this. So uh, actually the examples are, are consistent with this. The, so yeah, so we're saying the theory is, is at most an equal one, basically. Um, and if this is true, uh, then Sorry, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. sure. Okay. I thought there were the Cedar critical points in extending games supervisors, but you say, and you say they, they cannot come from the market. Yeah, yeah, sure. So that's exactly my point. Um, so you go to these examples and you check what other gauging turned on, mm -hmm. and you ask yourself, can I obtain this from a compactification? And it seems the gauging turned on are precisely those which forbid this. You, you cannot get it from a compactification. For instance, your gauging is a non-geometric flux, or it tells you, okay, you have extra dimensions, but they're non-compact, or this type of gauging, actually. So this particular class of different places, a twisted time. Sorry? I mean, you can rule out that they, can, they cannot come from such type of uh, compactifications on twisted time. Um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. He's saying something more general. I, I'm claiming something more general. Gauging and supergravity, yeah. they don't embed into swing theory. Yeah. Although many of these gauge supergravities, these gaugings are like constants, and so they may, they may come from such a, may, they may come from a group manifold, actually. But, uh, yeah, but, but it's true that the claim, I mean, 
the claims are more general. We think it's true in more generally, but uh, of course we only work with these examples. At least some gauge supergravity people from Padova agree with us. That's that's already <laughs> already a good confirmation. Um, uh, but 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 I like to prove this, and for this I need a Nogo theorem here, and this is very hard to find. Uh, actually, we're we're trying to do this, but it's very hard. Um, Okay, if this is true, I think it's actually good news for phenomenology because, uh, well, you get n equal one or n equal zero. Uh, and so by only asking, I want a positive cosmological constant, you get something nice for particle physics, actually. In addition, you've got all these brains and things which are intersecting. So, you know, there's material to do particle physics a priori with the right number of supersymmetries. So I think that's actually interesting. Okay, um, this is also, it also plays an important role for the sitter in higher dimensions. So I'm going to say a word about this now. Uh, so another claim, another thought is that we think there's no the sitter solution with more dimensions, actually. And you can view also this with supersymmetry. So let me comment on this now. So we ask ourselves, can we find the sitter solutions uh, with um, with dimension between three and 10 in 10 D supergravities. So I, I hope everybody understands what this means. So I'm, I'm changing the dimension of the sitter and changing the dimension of the extra dimensions to add it to 10, add it up to 10. So to answer this question, we simply extended uh, no-go theorems, which we know about to just any dimension. And actually it can be done fairly easily. Um, and since you're in 10 D supergravities, you don't have many ingredients to play with. And so the result is that uh, there's actually no De Sitte solution if, if your dimension is eight, nine, or 10. Um, and so this was known already. Um, and we also proved there's no De Sitte solution in type 2B in D equals seven. Um, so the, the point is simply that with this high number of dimensions, you don't have the right ingredients in the extra dimensions to, to do the job, basically. So you hit the no-go theorem. Uh, now, coming back to, to your question, if you actually restrict to the oriented folds and D-brain configurations, which preserve supersymmetry, so in at least in the orthogonal way, uh, if you restrict to those, then it's even more constraining. You can then prove there's no distinctive solution in D equals seven, and it becomes very constrained in six and five. Um, so in six and five, for instance, in six, you uh, you only get one or two sets of orientifolds. For instance, you can have 06, 08, 068 uh, placed like this. This preserves supersymmetry. Uh, but the point is, it's only two sets. And I said in the previous slide, you need at least three sets to get the sitter. Uh, so, so then if you believe what I said before, then it, it, it would mean there's no De Sitter either in D equals six and five. Uh, so this is related to supersymmetry. Uh, if, if you want N equal one in 40, I think it means four supercharges, but I think you cannot get four supercharges only in higher dimensions. It, it's the same thing as the fact that if you want a supersymmetry preserving configuration, you can only get one or two sets. It's the same type of counting actually. Okay, so the bottom line of what I said already, we know where to find the city solutions, and we think we've learned general features, but the city solutions are to be found in D equal four. They need at least three or more sets of intersecting orientifolds and D brains, which means they're n equal one or less in four dimensions. They need certain fluxes, they need 60 curvature. So, so that's the bottom line. Yes. Good, good. Yeah, yeah. So this analysis we've done much more generally. So the only assumption is still smearing. So we take no warp factor, no dilaton. But that's the only thing. So no, no function. Uh, but we don't assume anything else. We don't assume the rest is constant. We don't assume um, a certain geometry. So it's just playing with equations of motion, which tells you this actually. 
Yeah. Do you still recover, for instance, just assuming this a constant delay to no warp factor, just assuming this, you still get the condition that you need negative curvature, for instance, and things like this. Okay, so uh, first difficulty is overcome. We know where to find the city solution. We find the city solutions in supergravity. Um, let me now be faster. I will mention more features. So a second difficulty or feature that we observe is the instability. So all these solutions that we found are actually unstable, they are perturbatively unstable. So it means you look at the 4D scalar potential, and there's always one field direction along which the, the potential is a maximum. Um, so uh, in case you do know this parameter uh, eta b, uh, this means this is negative. Uh, this is related to the second derivative of the Hessian of the uh, potential. This is the mass matrix also. You take the minimal eigenvalue of this, and if the minimal eigenvalue is negative, it means you have an instability, it means you have a, a maximum. So uh, yeah, so that's how it's negative. What's wrong with that? I mean, do you want to leave there now? Yeah. Good, good, good. Yeah, good. Is this bad? Good. <laughs> Is this bad for cosmology? Uh, but it's unstable. Okay, so we don't get a de Sitter vacuum. It's not a minimum, but actually uh, it could still be fine. So for inflation, or if you give up on the cosmological constant, but you say I have a rolling field, this is quintessence, uh, maybe it's okay. So actually the data by Planck on inflation, single field roll inflation, uh, now constrains eta v to be negative and of this order, 10 to the minus two. There's an error bar, but it, it's very likely to be negative. So they write it explicitly, they prefer concave potential. Uh, so from this perspective, it's not really bad to be uh, a bit unstable. Uh, rather, the problem we have is that we're too unstable. <laughs> so we are two orders higher. Uh, we always get minus one, uh, smaller than minus one. Uh, so it's like this, basically. Um, again, is this a draw rule? Or is this just We don't know. Uh, <laughs> Good, that's a second feature, maybe. Uh, okay, now, third and major difficulty, we come back to this one and two, whether the solution is classical or not. So, um, are the supergravity solutions classical string backgrounds? So, as I said, there were five things to check. So, a small string coupling, large volume or large, uh, well, you can neglect alpha prime, basically, that's the point. But you also have a number of orientable, which is bounded uh, by, by a fixed value. Uh, you want your fluxes to be quantized, and you want your group manifold to be compact. And this means you need to find the lattice, and there's a quantization condition on the lattice. Uh, yeah. So, so these are five requirements, and uh, we don't know a single example, which is okay with all this. Uh, but I want to stress that this was all only realized in 2018. So they had these all the city solutions, but they never checked this actually. They didn't think about this. It's only with the swamp plant and all these questions whether these solutions do come from string theory or not that people started to bother about this question. And it turns out that uh, in the few examples where we could check this, uh, it doesn't work. Often you have scalings at play. So when you make this, small, this becomes big and by, uh, I mean, no. Well, you make one thing small, the other thing changes and it's difficult to make everything okay at the same time. Yeah. There's another thing, right? Like maybe it's not really a requirement like this, but like there's a question of uh, whether the old modules are stabilized. This is uh, not included, but- so, um, yeah, so in this point, I don't care about this. I just want an extra mem of the potential, whether it's stabilized or not. At least I want an extra mem, and I want it to be a 
a string background. The question of moduli stabilized is more related to this, actually. Um, but as I argued here, a slight instability is maybe not, not dramatic. Um, but yeah. Okay, good. Somehow, uh, if you need oriented forms for this, you will never get the parametric uh, suppression. Good, 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 good. Here. Yeah. <laughs> so, what do you good. mean by this? <laughs> good, good. Um, yeah, let, let me say this. Maybe it's, it, it comments on your point. So, the key point is indeed that, as you say, there's actually no we, we, we think there's no parametric control on this question. So it means the, the classical solutions, if they exist, would be isolated points in field space. So you have your field space, and the solution is in a region like this here. You can move a bit your fields, your parameters, but it's all bounded. You cannot take this to the asymptotics, as you would like to do, to be sure you're classical. So you're like bounded in a region. You hope this region is classical, so you're not a bit in the asymptotics, but you cannot bring it to the asymptotics. So that's where it becomes a computational problem or numerical problem. You, you ask, you have a four parameter space and you ask the computer to find a small region, an isolated point there where you have a solution. And this is numerically very challenging. We're trying this. It, it's just, a, it's a numerical issue actually. Um, so, so that's certainly different than from some ADS solutions, which have more, less bounds, more freedom, and you can take it to, to the asymptotics. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's really the situation basically now. Yeah. Okay, so after all, maybe there's no DeSitter solution at all. All, all I said is, <laughs> we, we did learn a lot on DeSitter solutions, where to find them and so on, what they look like, but we don't have any good example actually. Okay, good. Um, I will now turn to the side results on the uh, Minkowski solutions, unless there's more question on this. All right. Yeah, yeah. If the red force is localized, you could have just more regions around the kind of trans, but the rest will be fine. Yes. This is what's nearing. It's much worse. Or not necessarily. Um, I think this is a different question. So here I was talking of the moduli space of the field space, if you want. So you're talking of the actual space. Um, so if, if you have a localized oriented fold, uh, you certainly hope the region you cannot trust is small. This remains to be verified, certainly. Uh, and that you can, yeah, you can average it out and you can trust your solution in most of the compact space. I think this is a different question, but maybe the localization actually helps on the, all these matters. Maybe it brings a bit of the R key. Uh, maybe it helps on these two questions, actually. But yeah, it's more work to do. When you say in the GKT case, for the next place in Bromwich, it goes in that direction. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So they have four intersecting O6, and they start computing the warp factor uh, in some expansion. and. Uh, yeah, they got some corrections to the solution and so on. Yeah, we should, we want to do the same here. It's just that DGKT is on the torus, it's simpler. And yeah, it's group manifolds. It's, yeah, yeah, but there's work to do now. Yeah. Good. Let's have a break and talk about Minkowski. And um, the reason I want to talk about Minkowski is because we had this classification of solutions, and so we started noticing things about Minkowski as well. The question here is, uh, if you have a mean, so if the idea about flux compactification is if you put many fluxes, curvature, orientifolds, many stuff, you try to complicate its color potential. And so you would think that you can stabilize everybody at some point. And so can all the fields be stabilized in a Minkowski solution? That's the question. And so we claim that it's not the case, that there's always one massless field, actually. Uh, so uh, it certainly comes from this classification, which gave us quite a sample of solutions. We had yeah, diversity of solutions with many different fluxes, many different geometries, and so on. For all of those, we sort of automatized the computation of the spectrum. So we to the potential, we computed the mass matrix for some fields and for all fields. 
we got the masses and so on. So here's here's a here's a sample of Minkowski solutions with their spectra. Uh, what matters is, as you can see, there's always a zero. Yeah. So whatever uh, orientifold, uh, uh, manifold, and so on we take, we always get a massless mode uh, in the Minkowski solutions. Uh, so by this, we don't necessarily mean a flat direction. It can be a flat direction, but it can also be a field which is present in the potential, but which is not stabilized. Uh, yes, that's a question I'm often asked. It's a good point. Uh, I, I don't know for now. I, I'm trying to look at it. Yeah. So, so it seems a scaling symmetry. Actually, it's like a scaling symmetry. Yes. So it's like, you, in other words, you can always factorize out something from your potential. You can also scale up the, the potential. And if the potential is zero in the first place, it is still zero. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, so it's zero at the critical point, right? But uh, yeah, along the whole line. Uh, Oh, by acting with this symmetry, I yeah, yeah, if you want, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the problem, so I started to do things like this. The problem is that what fields or what symmetry actually changes. Uh, it's not a universal okay. thing, actually. It, it's it seems it's not universal, so it's, it still changes according to which flux with try and so on. But it seems there's always one for some reason. So. Uh, yeah. Can be a body. It doesn't have to be a symmetry. Phi one square, phi two square. Yeah. yeah, I think what it, yeah, you can, well, this, you can factorize something else, that's, and then you can view it as a scaling symmetry, maybe. If the potential, the total potential doesn't have the scaling symmetry. Mm -hmm. It's some trivial potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so for instance, I mean, what I typically observe is something like this. You have a potential of, say, a field lambda and the other fields. What happens is that you get a, you get a function of lambda and another thing of the other fields. Uh, so the derivative with respect to lambda will only act on this, but since it's in zero at the critical points, so that will always vanish. So in that sense, it can be a symmetry or scaling symmetry in the sense that you can factorize this out and uh, the dependence on this is, yeah. The problem is that which field that we're talking about depends on the compactification scheme. It doesn't seem to be a universal thing, uh, unfortunately. Uh, otherwise, it would be like no scale. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a similar, similar situation. Maybe. If you view the dimensions as the dilaton, the ten dimensional dilaton, it would be the universe. Yeah, so so it's not this, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you what it is actually. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we have this conjecture uh, which says if you ten, take a 10D supergravity solution, which has a 4D Minkowski, you can compactify it to 4D Minkowski, there's always a 4D massless color among these fields. <laughs> So what are these fields? Uh, so it's the volume, the dilaton, and the volumes wrapped by the orientifolds and D-brain. So we think it's a mixture of these guys. Uh, and we think you need all of them. It's not one, one of them. But beyond this, we, we, we don't know. <laughs> so uh, it, it's not the first time uh, such an idea pops up, I think. Uh, but I think there are two important points here. Uh, one is that this claim is independent of supersymmetry. So I'm not saying the solution is supersymmetric or not. I'm not saying the theory is supersymmetric or not. Uh, and second thing is that I'm specifying which field sector to look at. And so th this could help if you want to prove this indeed. Um, interestingly, there's maybe a relation to the tachyon of the sitter because the tachyon of a field which is unstable also seems to lie among these fields in the sitter. So, Suppose you have a Minkowski solution with this massless mode, you manage to uplift it to the sitter somehow, then this massless mode may become the tachyon. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. But yeah, this, this certainly requires uh, more work. Um, um, it's also reminiscent of a stat pool conjecture. I wanted to mention it, uh, which also deals with uh, fields which are not stabilized, uh, although it, it's a bit different than, than this. 
Uh, it might also be valid beyond supergravity compactification because uh, in this example, they consider landau gisborg model uh, with Minkowski solution and they, they claim they always get massless modes as well. Uh, so maybe this goes beyond supergravity. Okay, last but not least, of course, uh, you would get corrections to this, right? So in a, in a full quantum gravity effective theory, there are corrections beyond supergravity. So you would certainly change this. It, it will not stay massless, I'm guessing. Uh, but if the corrections are small, then it, it means you still have a very light field. So it's, it's still many, maybe interesting for phenomenology. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say on this. I will turn to the other parts. But yes. Approaching question time. We already have many questions, but maybe you can think of trying to work. Up. Yeah, yeah. And so, how long do I still have? Then uh, fifteen minutes, including all the questions. And okay, okay, okay. Good. Okay, this will be faster. So, good. So, let's turn to potentials and their slopes. So, um, we come back to this theory here, and we said that maybe there's no the sitter critical points. It means we can have a positive potential, but the first derivative doesn't vanish. So probably this ratio is just strictly positive. So the question is, can we can we do cosmology in this situation? Well, in principle, we can because we just we can have slopes and rolling fields. This is what happens in inflation and quintessence. So the question is, can, what what is this ratio? Can it be very small? If it's very small, we can do quasi the city are almost flat, and there's a hope to do. Uh, cosmology. But the thing is, if this doesn't vanish, it's quite unlikely that it will be very small. So we, we, we think there must be a lower bound somehow, uh, forbidding uh, this to vanish. Um, so the question is, how much is this lower bound C? So there's been this Lucita Swampland conjecture that you heard about, which, uh, which claimed that this lower bound is one, this number is one in Planckian units. If this is true, there's no way to do single field floral inflation uh, because floral means this is very small. Uh, there's this parameter epsilon v uh, constrained by Planck to be this order. Epsilon v is the square of this, roughly speaking. So we're very far from one here. Um, okay, uh, but the point is that this Tositus Swampland conjecture has been refined a lot. Uh, we think this is way too much, and we think that. If something holds like this, it can only be true in the asymptotics of field space, actually, so when your field goes to infinity. So um, one realization of this, uh, this uh, thought is this transplanton censorship conjecture, the TCC, which says that, OK, you get such a bound, but only in the asymptotics. The bound, the number they get is square root of 2 thirds. It's 0 0.8. So it's close to 1, but yeah. Another way to view this is, is this picture. When you go to the asymptotics, typically your potential becomes a decreasing exponential. And so the claim here is that it's bounded by an exponential. So, so this is your potential. It can do whatever it does in the bulk. You don't care. But it's constrained in the asymptotics here. Mm -hmm. And the constraint is that it should be smaller than, a, a, than this exponential. Uh, so you can see here the rate in the exponential is square root of 2 thirds. Obviously, if you have an exponential v prime over v, it's just this rate lambda. And so, yeah, so that's why it's this constraints. Okay. So, um, well, you would say, okay, fine, then it's good. I can do the sitter, I can do slower inflation in the bulk. I don't really care about the asymptotics, right? Uh, yeah, maybe because of time, I just jump a bit ahead. So the problem with this thought is, is that, as you know, in string theory, the region where you can control things is rather towards the asymptotics. So the classical regime is getting things large, things small. So it's this corresponds to scalar fields in four dimensions. And so the region where you can control things is rather towards the asymptotic. Basically, in the bulk, that's where you control less. You get to strong coupling, et cetera. So, so that's certainly the problem with this idea. Then the question becomes, can we do cosmology in the asymptotics if you have such a bound? That's, that's now the question. So, so is this big, is this small? Can we do something with this on it? Okay. So um, 
Okay, because of time, I will uh, skip this slide about the TCC. Uh, the message here is that we have checked this number, which generalizes to this number in D dimensions. We have checked it a lot uh, in many string compactifications uh, in supergravity, and we, we match this number on the nose. So if you take supergravity and take potentials you get from supergravity, you do reproduce this bound on the nose. Uh, it's surprising to me, there's no reason for this to be true, but uh, it, it works. So, so you can believe in this bound, basically, that's the message. Uh, it's, it's well checked in many examples. Good, so let's, let's come back to this question I, I just asked. Uh, can we do cosmology in the asymptotics of field space then? Uh, so, as I said, we face these bounds, these TCC bounds. There are a few more things which appear in the literature. Uh, it's always the same order, right? We're close to one anyway. Um, there's one asymptotics, uh, there, there's one advantage, sorry, to, to work in the asymptotics, which is that, well, your potential goes to zero, so it becomes naturally small. So maybe you want to use it to do dark energy today because cosmological constant is very small today. So, so maybe that's one advantage, actually. So maybe you want to use this to the quintessence model, which is supposed to mimic the, the cosmological constant of the dark energy today. OK, so again, the same question. You have an exponential potential in the asymptotics. What are the observational bounds on this rate lambda? This is what I'm asking now. And so there were several papers checking this. One paper said the bound is 0 0.6. Other papers say it's 0 0.8. It depends a bit also on your error bars and so on. Uh, so lambda should be smaller than this, but we're saying it's bigger than this. Uh, so it's really tight, basically, if not excluded. But there's always an error bar, of course. So, so the answer is that, uh, well, it's tight. It's difficult. Uh, there's even actually a theoretical bound on accelerated expansion in the asymptotics. So your rate cannot be too big, otherwise you don't, don't get accelerated expansion, actually. Uh, and it should be smaller than square root of two. So yeah, all this is very tight. That's the bottom line. We need to be very precise, sure of our models in string theory, sure of the bounding from the observations, and see if we can do this or not. Maybe we should find more examples, or maybe we give up on this and turn to more exotic cosmological scenarios. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, time is time is out. Um, okay, more recently we we um, we characterized negative scalar potentials actually. Since the question is what type of scalar potential you can get in string theory, we also ask ourselves this question. Let me be faster. We had this anti-TCC, as we called it. Anyway, we, we run the same argument and we got a similar bound. So the bottom line is that if you have a negative potential like this, so here, which is something you often get in string theory, that there should be a bound of this kind, the same exponential. Your potential should go to zero above this uh, exponential. That's what we think. It's the same rate which appears. So there's also a constraint in the asymptotics. We checked it in several examples, DGKT in particular, but also others, uh, and it's working in the example we found. So, so I'm confused. What about potentials that go to minus infinity? Do they violate this now? Good. Um, the thing is that a potential going to minus infinity is not super physical, right? I mean, it needs to stop at some point. So, uh, yeah. But it, good. If you trust it, uh, I'm only claiming something for potential which goes to zero. Okay. okay. Um, in the last, yeah, I don't have much time, so let me just mention this mass bound I mentioned in the um, um, introduction very quickly, and then I'll be done. So, um, both from the TCC of an anti TCC, you get constraints on your scalar potentials in the asymptotics like this, yeah. either this or either this. It takes the same form. This ratio v prime over v is bigger than a constant c zero. 
It turns out we could prove a new bound on the second derivative, something which was not noticed before, not noticed in the TCC paper. And the bound is simply the same number square. This is pretty obvious because if you have a, an exponential, you derive it twice, then you get the number square. Good. Let me skip the detail. If you apply this to an anti sitter solution, you translate this into a mass square. And this is the cosmological constant. So you just translate what you get and you get this value. This is what you get. Mass square is smaller than minus two in units of the ADS radius in any dimension because quite magically, the dimension relation between cosmological constant and radius is just this one, actually. So it just drops out. So, so I don't understand. Are you still at infinite? Good, good, good. So that's where I wanted to be fast. Sorry for this. Uh, yeah, no. So good. This is valid at the asymptotics. Yeah. yeah. And actually away from critical points because I'm also using this. So there's certainly a gap here. Yeah. So I'm extrapolating this result to, so I'm here and I'm moving here. I'm extrapolating this bounds. Question is, what happens when I move in field space with such a bounds? Is the spectrum preserved? Is it not preserved? What happens? Okay, uh, let's just check it and see what it gives, right? And, but but this, this would be something to study what happens when you move in moduli space or field space. What it gives you is this. Uh, the BF bound, this was your question, is below this. Uh, in the equal four, it's minus 2.5, and then it becomes more and more negative. So anything which is perturbatively unstable is okay with our bound because perturbatively unstable means you're below the BF bound, so you're necessarily below minus two. So what about stable ADS? So we started to go to the literature, look for all stable ADS we could find, check the spectrum, and check whether this is okay. <laughs> so uh, we did a table like this. Uh, and it's actually okay uh, in most examples. So if you take supersymmetric solutions, uh, you do find a scalar, which, is, which has a mass smaller than minus two or equal to minus two in almost all examples. But these are the examples we checked. If you have others, we're, we're happy to check it. And you always get something between minus two and the BF count. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So if this was true, in general, it would mean that there's no uh, holographic dual CFT with a no rather than the formula. Absolutely, yeah, this is what it would mean. Yeah. And there are no counterexamples? Don't ask me, but yeah, I'd like to know as well. <laughs> because I thought that there was there were bounds from like bootstrap and things like that. So, you, that, so your first operator cannot be too large uh, of a dimension, but I don't think there was some interesting. I don't know. I, I'd like to know. This is certainly the question which gets raised by this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is very fresh. So yeah, yeah. I'd like to. I'd like to know if, if there's a good argument against this. Yeah, yeah. For extended uh, supersymmetry, at least you can check the scalar in the graviton multiple. I mean, maybe. Yes. Already, yeah. Yeah. It's already, already satisfying your bound. Um, because that's simply group theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm think. Yeah, I'm thinking that is trans what you say that if this is true, there should be a way to prove it just in supergravity, right? Taking certain multiplets, a certain scale. It should be a generic thing well, because. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, for instance, using supersymmetry. Um, yeah, but uh, I, I don't know if it's yeah. Um, Okay, um, there are just a few exceptions in this table. If you look closely, there are a few zeros here. Mm -hmm. A few exceptions are KKLT, large volume scenario, and DGKT. Those are very debated in the literature for different reasons. Um, I'm not gonna come back to these reasons. Uh, if you do trust these ADS solutions, it means, as we just said before, that moving from the asymptotics to the critical point then changes completely the spectrum and you ruin the property basically. But this, yeah, this should also be uh, studied. Sorry, what about DGKT? Both are heavily debated. Yeah, 
Well, digital KT is debated because it's one of the only examples with scale separation. Some people don't like it. Uh, so then the study is back reaction to see if it's still scale separated, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. yeah. Some people say, well, it has a Roman's mass. What does it mean? Is it okay or not? Yeah. Okay. I think I should uh, I should stop probably for time reasons. So um I had a comment on scale separation. I'll skip this. Just a word on non SUSY cases. There are a few examples of non SUSY perturbatively stable ADS solutions. We have a similar table. It works less well. So we get rather this type of bound there. On the other hand, there's also this conjecture or checked in many examples that all these solutions have typically non perturbative instabilities. So I'm not sure if we should consider them at all or not. Uh, but yeah, that's. Um, Okay. Okay. Let me just flash this. This is everything I said. Uh, so dark energy is difficult. We're working on this. We need more searches. We need to explore more. And there are these side results, which certainly deserve more study as well. Thank you. Thank you.